emotion triumphs mm. logic yep. in the modern world, right? So you can sit down there and you can talk about the importance of gas, not just for Australia, but for the rest of the world. Uh, and what's the answer? Oh, well, look, the, 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 we've got a catastrophe and the world will end. Emotion triumphs logic. And it will continue to triumph logic, in my view, until such time as um, people are sitting in houses that they can't afford to heat. Mm. And they'll think to themselves, hmm, you know, this is not a very good situation. <laughs>
You know, I think value is uh, the most important thing. Culture is downstream from values and politics is downstream from culture. Brilliantly put. Uh, but, but values is where it all starts. And, uh, you know, I think the flowering of the Western model was largely based on the Judeo-Christian views. Um, one of which, by the way, was that you, you weren't defined by your your class or your sex or your religion. You know, there's, uh, there's neither Jew nor Greek. Uh, uh, this was the idea that every person was... Man nor woman, fr- slave nor free. Slave nor free. Uh, every person derived their value as an individual because they were made in the image of God. Um, that they had to be treated with respect because they were in the image of God. Um, that that they should be judged and held accountable as an Im- individual uh, in the image of God. Now, that idea, I think, uh, found its way into constitutions and laws and eventually into politics. Um, and, and, and the flowering moment, I would say, probably was uh, during the 20th century. Uh, but at this moment of flowering success, Technological success, scientific success, artistic success, cultural success. Uh, the West somehow lost its confidence in itself and was very, very open to a political attack and reversal. And I think that's what we're, we're seeing now, political attack and reversal uh, by people who probably never accepted uh, those values, never accepted that culture, never accepted that politics. Mm. They've come along with their own version and they've been very successful, I'd say. I think that's a very useful understanding you've just set out there, that, that our politics in a way, uh, in, the, in a Western democracy, should be downstream of culture and culture is downstream of, as you put it, values. But the values themselves are probably driven by beliefs. And as uh, we talk, there's been a fascinating um, bit of research released by the Wall Street Journal that's floating around. And it shows that if you go back to those days, the very days you were talking about, when we were in office, um, you had that period after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the world is safe for democracy, you know, that's what's won out. Francis Fukuyama saying, uh, uh, you know... The uh, end of history. The end of history, which was a play on Marx. Marx said that the end of history would be the socialist state. Right. And he uh, was saying, no, it's not the socialist uh, state, it's uh, a democracy. Liberal democracy. We thought it was safe yeah. in 1998. At that uh, time in America, according to this work, this is really interesting, worth just tracing through, 70% of Americans said patriotism is important to them. Mm. Now it's down to 38%. 62%, that's two thirds roughly, of people said religion was very important to them. It's now down to below 40%. Having children which you've talked about a lot. Mm. If a country is going to have a future, you know, it's, it's children are its future. 60% of people thought it was very important. And now only 30 do. That's a massive shift in mm. 25 years. There's also been a collapse in a commitment to community involvement. Um, and interestingly, um, it's across all age groups, but it particularly applies to young people. Yeah, I think that's right. I think young people have been particularly um, atomised by, by social media. I mean, the, the, the funny thing about social media is that you'll engage all the time with, with a machine rather than with individuals. The days of going off to the youth group or the scouts or, or, or the sporting club, you know, has been, has been left behind by the days of engaging in TikTok and uh, promoting yourself to the world. What we used to call social capital seems to have declined across the board. Um, I, th- I think... Uh, when you come to things like patriotism, um, not only have people probably lost interest in patriotism, but they're now being fed this ceaseless diet that there's nothing to be patriotic about, right? What, why be patriotic if, if, if your country is really just a colonial yeah. society? You're you know, inheriting a nightmarish culture you, you, that's not you, worth you, defending. You, 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 you're, in, you're, you're living off uh, crimes of the past, um, you can't be proud of, of, of any of that. I, I think this is, and I'll talk about Australia here. Um, you know, I, I know, like nearly all Australians, my forebears came to this country looking for a better life. Um, uh, they were persecuted people in one way or another. It didn't have much opportunity. Um, 
they came to Australia because they saw this as a place of opportunity. And this, this was the migrant story of Australia. Generation after generation, you know, uh, the Irish, the Scots, the English, you know, and then, of course, the, the Greeks and the Italians. This was an immigrant society where, where you could do better. Vietnamese, the Chinese, the Indians. But we're now being fed this sort of view that, oh, it's all just a racist, colonialist society. You can't be proud of that. What I'm proud of is that Australia gave my forebears and, and millions of other people an opportunity they would never have had in life. And you they, and me. Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't steal land from anybody, by the way. Uh, mostly they came and they, they lived in very, very poor quarters, right? They bettered themselves. They contributed to society. They paid their taxes. They got education. They raised their kids. You know, to me, it's a, a wonderful example uh, of a success, right? Um, and Australia, which couldn't feed itself, can now feed you know, itself and a good deal of the world as well. It, it, it's now self-sufficient in energy and exporting to the world as well. This is a, this is a very, very successful society. And, and yet uh, you're being fed on this idea that uh, somehow it, it, it's all shameful, it was born in original sin, uh, you know, that, that you can't be proud of your country. So when you say, oh, patriotism's down, of course it's down. <laughs> you're being told there's nothing really to be patriotic about. Uh, and I do, I do feel, in Australia at least, um, we we should celebrate the successes. Now you know you can compare, even if you want to compare us to other immigrant societies, you want to compare us, let's say, to Latin America, right? People came out of Europe and settled in Latin America. Um, it wasn't nearly as successful in terms of political stability, in terms of economic growth in terms of, 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 of uh, exports and what's it's contributed to the world. I mean, this was, in Australia, a very successful experiment. You know, the, the people who, for the people who came here. Now, um, you'll, the, the critics will say to you at this point, ah, but that's for the people who came here. What about the people who were already here, they will say. Uh, it wasn't so successful for them. And it wasn't entirely successful for them, of course not. But it was successful for many Aboriginal people. People forget that. It was, you know, many Aboriginal people, including all of the people who are the leaders of the Aboriginal um, movement today, all got good education. They got good health. You know, they, they were enabled to um, lead Aboriginal people in a modern society. Um, it was not all, all successful. I can see that. But it was not all failure either. And I just feel that we ought to remember when we're talking about uh, our country and what it's done and where it's been. There's a lot of things that should be celebrated. We shouldn't brush over the past, but we shouldn't allow the past, uh, uh, we shouldn't allow a version of the past to completely um, undermine the great successes that we've had by international standards. Picking up on this idea of, um, uh, of democracy being the result of a lot of thinking about the value of the individual, recognising that individuals vary in many ways. The ideas of a basic freedoms, conscience, speech, assembly, property, are the result of not only of a lot of hard thinking, but also of people trying to come to grips with how we live with our differences. Democracy ought to be the ideal mechanism by which we resolve our differences, find our common ground and move forward. And yet now it seems to have become a vehicle for division. We don't seem anymore to see democracy as the way to handle our, our, our deepest differences. Yeah, I look, there's two ways of looking at democracy. Um, the first way is that um, the majority will prevails. So whoever gets more votes in an election becomes the government. Right? But it's not just the will of the majority that prevails, in a real democracy, minority rights would also be protected. Uh, and that's what the law does. Um, the law says, um, even, even if there's a majorita majoritarian government, it, it can't go and persecute its, the people who didn't vote for it, can't go and persecute minorities. They have the protection uh, of, of the law and they're entitled to the protection of the law. And we've always recognised that. And it's one of the reasons why we've always tried to have limited government. Now, this is, this is something you won't hear many people talk about these days. 
Um, I'm a believer in limited government, right? I think the government's there for some purposes and should be limited from, 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 from just taking over every area of life that, uh, that someone wants it to. And the reason, downstream of culture. The, the reason why is that we've got to protect that individual liberty, even for minorities. They have to be protected. You know, the government can never take away someone's freedom of speech or freedom of conscience or freedom of religion. Uh, and, and that's why government has to be limited. Um, and and what, what nobody seems to worry about, I do, but not many people seem to worry about these days, is the expansion of the state. Uh, I see the expansion of the state as inevitably affecting individual rights and individual liberties, um, and increasingly determining what it's acceptable to say and what it's not acceptable to say. Um, and I think we had more freedom when the state was limited. Government is, government is much bigger today, in our country and generally speaking in the West, than, than it's ever been before. Uh, and yet I don't think it's solved the basic problems that people are really worried about, you know, problems in their relationships and their marriages and their children. Because the state can't solve those problems. There's an area where the state just runs out of power. What, what the state can basically do is it can tax and spend. That's what it can do, tax and spend. But can taxing and spending fix a relationship? You know, can, it, can it give kids goals in life? Can it, can it em, empower communities to look after each other? I don't think so. I don't think there's a tax that's been invented or a spending program that's been invented that's going to fix those things. Point taken. Um, and I'd love to come back to this idea of big government impacting on our freedoms because you're now seeing a drift towards a sort of a, a call for a global government that's coming out, I think, of the WEF. You know, the problems confronting mankind are so great that we've got to magnify. But before I do, back to young people for a moment. There's some emerging evidence that particularly in the English-speaking world, that young people who tend to be left of centre, perhaps when they're at university, idealistic and what have you, but there's an old saying that by the time they're 30, you know, um, their heads have caught up and they've moved back to the centre or the centre right. It's mm. not happening anymore. Mm. And there's two interesting aspects to that that I'd just welcome your views on. One is in part it's because they can't get their foot on the economic ladder. It's so hard for them to get into a house. A Californian, Joel Kotkin, has done some research on Australia, and it's astonishing the number of young Australians who don't believe they'll ever have a home. And if they do, it'll only be because of inheritances. It won't be. They don't see themselves as being able to work their way into it. So they don't feel invested in, in it. And there's another follow-on, which you've talked about, family formation. It's now impacting family formation. You've got people who can't start a home. They don't feel able to start a family with it. And in fact, our birth rate's dropping quite significantly. What's happening to young people in terms of their commitment to democracy? And why are they tending, I think, to pursue policies which are actually only exacerbating the very things they're worried about? Yeah, I mean, the old expression, if you're not a socialist at mm. 20, you don't have a heart. And if you're not a conservative at 30, you don't have a head. Um, and I, I think when you're young and you don't pay tax, you're inclined to the view that whoever else is paying tax should be fixing my problems one way or another. And until you start paying tax yourself, you don't sort of realise that uh, there's a cost benefit uh, in, in all of these policies. I think with young people, and I agree, I think home ownership is very important for young people. I always believe that. Um, and, and it's always been a big feature of, uh, of Australia. Um, I think younger people, though, are doing everything later in life, though, uh, John, you know, they're expecting to live to 90 or 100. They're expecting to have four or five different jobs. Um, uh, they'd rather travel than put down a deposit on a house. I mean, that's, that's part of it. Um, it's lifestyle. I think also, if you're a young person and you've grown up in our country, you haven't really seen a recession for 30 years. And I think as inflation rises and interest rates rise, it's going to come as a bit of a shock. And, you know, some of these people might begin to think, well, the economy is more important than, than they used to. 
Uh, and I also think standards have changed. Um, it, you know, if you go back 30 years ago, we had much smaller houses, but average of four people in them. Now we've got houses that have doubled in size, but the average household uh, is, is halved in size uh, mm. in, in these houses. So they're expecting a lot more standards uh, in relation to the housing. But, yeah, I agree with you. I do think it's important to give somebody a little stake. And I'll, and I'll speak for this country. All of our research, our longitudinal research, really shows that the difference between a secure retirement and an insecure retirement is owning your own house. You can, you can live on a pension if you own your own house. Mm. Um, but if you're still renting at 60, you're going to be under a lot more pressure. If I were to put it to you, in part we're talking here today because I have a podcast series and I started the podcast series because during the great financial crisis and the wash-up afterwards, I became really concerned about the fissures in Western society. We didn't seem to be thinking it through clearly um, there seemed to be this demand that government solve every problem. I think Western governments lost control of their budgets. They were, most of them with the exception of this one. Listeners will know because we often refer to it. Uh, even Jordan Peterson's been fascinated by it. Uh, you led the team that uh, ended the deficits, paid the debt out, uh, set up uh, the Future Fund, which you've been sharing. That's a remarkable story. But the GFC, the wash-up, you know, you really saw people saying, the government's got to solve the problem. And no, I won't wear any pain in now repairing the damage and repaying the debt and raising productivity. So, but government's realising that the only way to cope with debt is, you know, you, you either raise productivity uh, and, and a combination of that, reducing expenditure. Oh, the other option, sorry, is, is to try and inflate your way out of it. So they went for inflation because that's the easy option. And I think we've been doing that for a long time. It was always going to trip us up, wasn't it? Oh, I think it was. So in so Australia... This, the link, just to expand it for a moment, is where we'd gone to culturally, no, we won't wear pain. We expect government to solve every problem. We're not into resilience and making tough decisions. So government went for the easy option, which is actually proving to be very dangerous. Yeah, so I, I, I'd say the, the, the two big events uh, in the last 15 years, um, economically, was... Um, Financial crisis, 2008, uh, COVID um, pandemic of 2020. So the financial crisis of 2008 comes up. And what is the lesson that um, governments, not just in Australia, but around the Western world said? Well, we've got a financial crisis on our hands. We better do two things. We better make money easier and we better spend more. In technical terms, we'll call that um, monetary stimulation, fiscal stimulation. Mm -hmm. But don't worry about it. Once the financial crisis is over, we'll raise interest rates again, get monetary policy back to where it was, and we'll balance our budgets and pay off the spending. So we go through 2008, 2009, but we do neither, really. We do neither. Um, we certainly don't balance any budgets. Uh, and, and a half-hearted attempt to normalise monetary policy. Then we come into 2020, COVID. What should we do? Oh, I know what we'll do. We'll do monetary stimulation and fiscal stimulation. Well, th by this stage, we haven't got any interest rates that we can cut, so we'll create money. It's called quantitative easing to make money even cheaper. And we'll spend more. So we go through COVID and we create a whole lot of money and we spend a whole lot of money. And the idea is, oh, well, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll reverse this down the track. Well, of course, the first whiff of grape shot as we start reversing the monetary stimulation, a um, couple of banks roll over, Silicon Valley Bank, maybe some other banks. So the question is, what do we do? Do we, do we sort of keep the easy monetary yes. policy going? Because, yeah. good heavens, some banks, we might, we might be right back into bank failures. And, and, and this is the problem we've now got ourselves into, that we have become so used to easy monetary policy. 
so used to fiscal stimulation, we, we, we can't get ourselves out of it. You know, as, 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 as someone said, um, getting yourself out of easy monetary policy is like the Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave, right? Yep. And, and, it's, and it's the leaving of this extraordinary stimulus that is now proving so difficult. Now, in Australia, and it's the same around the world, but I'll speak for Australia because I know it um, a lot better. Um, you know, we haven't balanced the budget now for 15 years. You know, we've we've egged up our our total debt to GDP from about ten percent of GDP to sixty. Now, if we don't get out of this by the time we go into the next crisis, it's going to be a next crisis. They come along very very regularly, by the way, financial crises and economic. Instead of going into the next one at ten percent debt, we'll go in at sixty, right? And we'll come out of that one at hundred, and then we'll go into the one after that at hundred. We'll come out at two hundred. Now. What are you going to do with all of this debt? Right? In Australia, we're heading up to a trillion dollars of debt. Well, nobody thinks we will we'll pay it back. Nobody got a plan to pay it back. We'll just ratchet it up through each cycle. And this is where I do feel for young people, actually. Mm. Um, the debt isn't going to go away. No. It will have to be serviced. And who will have to service it? Well, not you and I, because... You know, we'll be off our mortal coil in about 20 years' time or whatever. The young people that are being born today, they'll have to service this debt, the debt of 2008, the debt of 2020, the debt of 2030, the debt of 2040. And and you've got to remember, this is going to bite into their, their spending power. Their taxes are going to be higher. Uh, and, and this is where I think, you know, I would say to you, and I always argued this when I was in government, Low debt is a youth policy. Yeah. Low debt is a youth policy. I remember. Well, what, what can we do for young people? We can give them a society where all they have to do is pay for their spending, not pay for their spending and our spending. Yeah. Right? Agree. We're giving them a society where they're going to have to pay for our spending and all of the generations mm. that go before them and then turn around and try and fund themselves. This is a very anti-youth policy. Every time I hear someone say, oh, you know, no, spend some more money, help the young people. Actually, yeah. spending the more money, mm. if it's borrowed, and it is all borrowed for 15 years, every uh, every uh, extra uh, spent. deficit, every extra marginal dollar has been borrowed. Uh, you're, not, you're not giving them much of a go. And the whole debate in Australia has now become, oh, well, you know, we've opened up this big gap between spending and tax, so we've got to think of some higher taxes. I, I want someone to say, well, why don't we think of going back to the kind of spending we used to have? Then, then we'd be able to do it all on the tax base that uh, that we've got. But th- that that argument just seems to be going now. Here's the point: every time you ratchet up debt, every time you ratchet up spending, and inevitably, therefore, ratchet up, ratchet up tax. Uh, every time you do that, the Government expands. Yes. Right? So the government's taxing more, the government's spending more, the government's borrowing more, the government expands. And every time you do that, you know, you are, you are creating this huge operation which now has much more reach in all sorts of areas. And, and, and that, to me, um, does impinge on individual liberty. You see, John, I'll say to you, I think we went far too far during the COVID pandemic. Yeah. No? Almost further than any other Western country in terms you, of expenditures. You, you know, I promise you, you, you know, we will look back on 2020, 2021, in 10 years time, 20 years time, and we'll say, wow, we really closed the workplaces? Mm. You know, in, in some states, curfews? You weren't allowed out of your home after nine o'clock? We didn't have curfews in the Second World War, by the way. The curfews? Uh, we had situations where if you walked around the block on your own, you had to have a mask on your own. And there's no way you can infect somebody if you're walking around the block on your own, by the way, right? Uh, we had a situation where you were locked in your house 23 hours a day, given one hour. One hour. Mm. 
it is uh, to go out stone. You look back on it and you say, I mean, how did we put up with that infringement of individual liberty? Well, you see, the government had enormous reach. You know, the government had huge media influence. The government was running daily press conferences, giving out body counts, you know, all the time. You know, this idea that if you went out, if you went out of your house for more than an hour a day, right, um, you know, you could die. Or worse, you could infect someone who would die. Uh, but somehow, if you only went out for 59 minutes, you know, you were going to, you were going to be safe. I mean, we, we'll look back and, and we'll say, wow, gee, did we all, did we all, you know, kids that weren't allowed to go to their parents' funerals. Uh, you know, I think you were allowed something like seven or eight people, something like that, um, at, at, a, at a funeral, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you weren't allowed to say goodbye to loved ones who were uh, who were dying, and to me, you know, this would have been unthinkable. I think in the Second World War, this kind of infringement on individual, even though we were at war, we didn't have curfews. Uh, but because the reach of the state now is so much greater, the public just by and large took it. Mind you, the police were out arresting anybody who broke any of these rules, right? Uh, yeah, you know, pregnant uh, women. Uh, a pregnant woman, you know, mm. put up on uh, on uh, social media that there was going to be a demonstration. Mm. As it turned out, entirely lawfully, you know, police come into her home, put her in handcuffs, take her off to uh, the police station, right? Enforcing the law. Uh, it was just intimidation. Uh, as it turns out, there's no charge that uh, the charge got dropped, right? But it was just intimidation. The, you know, the police might come into your home. Uh, and they might arrest you. And, you know, I think for some people too, I better not say anything about this because if I do say something about this, you know, well, who knows, could be reported. I, I think we'll look back and we'll say um, this was a massive overreaction. Now, the economic cost is there to stay. Um, we'll see that for a, a long period of time. Mm-hmm. Now, what are we going to learn out of this? Because there's going to be another pandemic, by the way. Of course there is. Or some sort of crisis. There'll be another pandemic. Mm. To go back broadly um, to the times when you and I were sitting around that cabinet table trying to get down the debt because it was running at just short of 20% of GDP uh, and other Western countries likewise were becoming worried about theirs, which were typically around that 40, 45%, the other major Western economies, mm. much higher than ours. Mm. We got ours under control. We got ours to zero. Well, See, this is yeah. a big point. We got ours to zero. We just paid off all of the debt. The Brits didn't. The Americans didn't, right? So we went into these crises yep. from an incredibly strong position. And even to the COVID spending you were talking about, in a sense, that was done on the shoulders of work. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, you go back to 2006, 2007, what was our net debt to GDP ratio? Zero. Actually, yep. it was minus. It was, it was minus. minus. Yeah, right? that's right. We actually had money in the bank. The future fund. You want to go and have a look at uh, the Brits or the Americans? Yep. They were already up around 30, 40, right? So and they... losing control, which is the point. We're at 60 now. Yeah. Further shocks will lose control, just like they did. Yeah, and so if we'd have gone in at the, the levels that uh, they'd have gone in, we'd be at 100 now, mm, right? But right. we didn't. We went in at zero, right? So we're, we're, it's total federal and state, mm. 60, federal, 40. Uh, but next time we'll come out at 100. We're, 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 we're sort of, sort of, and when, when you hear people, this is always, you know, fascinates me, people you know, often big spending people say, oh, we can afford to borrow more because, you know, by comparison, yeah. our debt to GDP ratio is low. It's only low because we actually paid it all off in 2007. If we hadn't have done that, if we'd have emulated the Brits or the Americans, or anything, it would be exactly the same as this. And of course, mostly the people who say, oh, it's low, we can afford to borrow more, were the people who opposed paying it off back yes. then. <laughs> you know, so, oh, let's take the benefit of the policy we yeah. opposed back then. Oh, OK, I mean, that's <laughs> politics, isn't it? <laughs> but, and, and, but my response to that is to say, just understand, we are at the point where other major economies lost control. Yeah, you lose control. You know, and uh, see, here's, here's the other point. Uh, it's one thing to borrow a trillion dollars, as we in Australia are, not quite there, but pretty close. Uh, at one percent, yes, it's another thing to 
borrow a trillion dollars at 4%, right? Yeah. So um, even if you just held your debt steady at a trillion, the cost of it, the interest cost, yeah. is going to go from about 10 billion to 40 billion. It's going to go up $30 billion, yeah. right? By right. about, what, 2030? Well, yeah, as it, as it rolls around. As it rolls around. Right. I, yeah. I'm just talking about projections. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. six or seven years' time now. Yep, yep. Before Some of it's spend... already rolling up, by the way. Yes. Because yep. it's when your bonds roll yep. off, you know, and some of it won't roll off for uh, yep. another five yep. years and some, a very small amount won't yep. roll, roll, roll off for 10 years. Yep. But on average, over time, you know, what we were borrowing at 1% yep. will move to whatever the rates are now, 4%, let's say. That's $30 billion yep. of extra interest, right? Well, $30 billion, just to put this in context, that's, that's the Medicare system. Yeah, that's right. So before you've done anything, that's just your cost. Yep. And whether the you're most doing recent, the most doing recent budget here school, in Australia said defense. the fast. For, here's a, here's a, here's a trick question: fastest growing area of government spending in the last year, interest, interest yes. costs. Yeah, yeah. And and for those of my beloved listeners, and I say this really sincerely, who whose eyes are glazing over, saying that's just an argument about economics, a sweet set of numbers. It's not. You're closely tying it to outcomes for people, particularly young people. Young That's people. the point. Young people. This is the point. This is the point. The young people, that debt, that trillion dollars debt, which they didn't borrow, right? wasn't borrowed when, when they were adults in the world. That trillion dollar debt becomes their debt. Yeah. And the 40 billion of interest payments yeah. becomes their payment yeah. year after year after year yeah. after year, right? Yeah. So that's that's what you need. You know that you need another forty billion dollars in addition to their schools, their hospitals, their defence, and then another forty billion for what happened back here. I think these things are incredibly important as as you think and as I think. And I think one of the problems, to pay you a compliment, and tentatively, nervously say this, perhaps even your predecessor, and we might have disagreed with him politically, but you explain things. No one's explaining this now. So young people are inclined. I don't want to be down on them. That's not my objective. But they've been fed a constant diet of government can solve this problem. No one points out the obvious. It's actually governments don't have money. Mm. And when they spend money, it belongs to taxpayers. Mm. And if today's taxpayers don't live within their means, then the children, That's right. when they're adults, and this is going, they're worried about flatlining wages and increasing asset prices now. All mm. of this simply promises to make it worse. Yeah. So what's happened? Thomas Sowell made a fascinating comment, the American observer. He said, the problem is not that little Johnny can't think, he can think. The problem is not that little Johnny can't feel, he can feel. The problem is that little Johnny thinks feeling is thinking. Yeah. What's happened to our ability to think critically, to weigh, accumulate and weigh the evidence and the facts, Peter? And I guess I'm asking a little bit here. It's not just a cultural question. What's happened in our education system? Yeah, well, emotion we is king. People no, emotion is king these days. Yeah. So um, the way you resolve um, um, any dispute is is with emotion. And by and large, the people who make the biggest emotional claim tend to win most of the arguments. They do. And, and you know, you can see this particular, I, I think, on social media um, or, or Twitter... Um, Twitter is not the place for a reasoned argument, uh, you know, for and against. Mm. Twitter is the place for an emotional claim. And the more emotional the claim, um, the better. And so, you know, we are raising young people on social media where you resolve an argument with an emotional claim, right? And are we, we now surprised that they don't want to uh, resolve an argument with reasoned and logic debate. You know, the attention span, John, is like that, right? And um, you know, I, I, for, for all the good social media has done, um, it's done a lot of bad too, I think. It's, it's shortened the attention span. It's coarsened the debate. It's, it's, it's led to, I think, the promotion and the normalisation of extreme views. Mm. Right? Yep. And the point about it is, you see, there's, there's no editorial. There's no editorial on social media, right? Uh, the newspaper, there's an editor. 
the editor says you can't say that because it's defamatory or it incites a crime. And then, on on social media, you can defame whoever you like. You know, you can incite crimes. You know, maybe if it's a really bad crime, somebody will try and um, chase you down. You you can meet um, similar criminals and normalise your behaviour. Um, you know, there there is there is no filter, and uh, you ought to look at some of this stuff. It's a sewer. Oh yeah, there. absolutely. And, you know, in a way, we're finding new ways to deny, to deny people their freedom of conscience for fear they'll be cancelled. Mm. It's really Some things weird. get cancelled very easily. If, if you, you know, if you have a, a non-political view, apparently that can be cancelled on Facebook or Twitter. But, you know, there's all this sort of what I regard as you know, quasi-criminal activity. It never gets cancelled. Mm. You know? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and it can be unbelievably damaging, even to the point of people ending their own lives, young people. Uh, yeah, I, I've, look, this is, I think this is a really big thing in our society, online bullying. Yeah. Because if you're a young person and you've grown up in a society where you get your validation from likes, you get yeah. your validation from um, followers, mm. the moment, you know, your, your, your likes... Um, disappear or your dislikes come in or your followers say something nasty, your whole self-esteem is pulled apart. Mm. And it is a big issue with young people. Suicide, self-harm, um, out of social media. And and it, it also empowers bullies. See, you're in public life, you know, somebody starts twittering to you and saying you've done this or you've done that wrong. Because it's about you, you tend to believe it, right? But the person that's sending it, it's probably a fake name, is probably somebody who who has no real expertise in the area and they're starting to bully you. And and it's just been made an absolute campaigning weapon uh, of, of bullying for people in public life. Uh, you know, once upon a time, I would read comments about myself <laughs> Don't, all you're doing is you, if you, you're letting the bully get into your head. That's all you're doing. Um, if 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 you read that stuff, um, now that if that bully, for example, wanted to write a letter to the newspaper, the the letters editor would say, "Well, who is this person? Is this a reasoned argument? No, it's not. It's just emotion. It's just bullying. It wouldn't get published." Mm. But you see, on these platforms, there's no editorial. Mm. And some of these people operate under multiple names. And then, you know, if you want to raise it to the the nth degree, uh, it can be done by bots. Yep. Uh, and and now you, 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 you can even have state-sanctioned bullying. In the face of all of this, in one sense, what we're talking about is disengagement. People pull back. They say, I'm not going to be engaged. So they withdraw from the public debate. And we're seeing that in the in the juvenile and overly uh, emotionalised debate about public finances, for example, which we've just touched on. But there's a, another, even more serious problem, I think. People are actually disengaging uh, from involvement in the public square. I think that's right. They're going home. I think that's right. Um, you think of the numbers that used to stand for pre-selection, quality uh, people, uh, large numbers for a seat in Parliament. Yeah. Uh, they're not doing it anymore. Yeah. Um, I'm told that uh, the two major British par uh, parties had between them three million members uh, until quite recently. It's just collapsed. Now there are more members of the Royal Society of Birdwatchers in Great mm. Britain than there are members of the political parties. But it's not just there. It's more relaxing. <laughs> it, wow. Um, uh, you know, you, you talk to school councils. I've had this, I, I'm surprised how often I'm... Can you help us identify some people? No one wants to come onto our school council anymore. Mm. Uh, you talk to country shows and there are not enough young people coming through. You t everywhere. People are not coming forward in this age mm. of fear of being cancelled and this age of uh, radical individualism, uh, of identity politics. I think that's a major threat. Yeah, it's, it's funny. You, you're not getting your engagement face to face. They're engaging on social media, by the way. But they're not engaging um, face to face. Well, well, young people are. Young uh, people are. Yeah, a that. lot of pulling out. 
Uh, well, I hope they are, because mm. I think, as I said, um, there's a lot of risk. But mm. you see, if, if, if I join um, a school council, um, I deal with other people, I, I hear dissenting views, I mean, hopefully we do it in a respectful way. Um, I pull out of all of that because I'm not allowed to put my view or my dissenting view is not respected. Um, you, you, you lose that sort of moderation that human interaction gives you. And I think that'll make our society poorer. It's not just the political parties, by the way, John. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying it's, it is. It's, it's at every it's, level. It's the Rotary, it's the Scouts, oh, it's yes. the church, yep. it's the synagogue, it's, I don't know about the mosque. I mean, it, 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 it is... It is. That's my point. People are disengaging that's right. across the board. Yeah, yeah. And that shows up in that American survey work that we were beginning about. You know, and, and it goes to the heart of you talking about a strong civil society neither wanting nor tolerating big government. Well, you see, and again, you see, this creates the void, mm. right? So civil society is retreated. Well, who do you think is going to fill the void? Government. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Um, the government will now. You, 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 you may not learn your, your mores and your views from the school council or from the scouts or from the church. So you know who's going to tell you what they should be now? The government. Yeah. And you can see that now in their attempt, not only in the state public school systems, yeah but in gaining control over the independent schools yep. at the very same time that parents are flocking to the independent schools, yep. states who don't care what parents think mm. or want mm. are now trying to make sure that they can control, they can effectively raise the children through that state system, it seems to me. Um, to, um, to, to come back to uh, a couple of economic questions and then a, a couple of, um, I'd be interested in your views on a couple of geopolitical matters globally. Um, it seems to me that one of the things that's being left out of the debate about interest rates is the role of government. So we're all saying, oh, the Reserve Bank's you know, made a terrible mess, or mm. depending on your position on it, and it's got to get this thing under control. Mm. Nobody is holding governments mm. to account mm. for overspending. I agree with them. So you, you've got, if you like, two arms of officialdom mm. in conflict with mm. one another. And well, see, media, they, there's almost this they were they were in lockstep in 2008, as I said, easy money fiscal stimulation. They were in lockstep in 2020, easy money fiscal stimulation. Now, inflation takes off, as it as it as it always will. If you if 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 your money is, is too cheap and too easy, right? Inflation. Reserve Bank rightly says, well, we've got to tighten monetary, and normally a government would rightly say, well, we've got to yeah. tighten spending, yeah. right? Got to bring in a few balanced budgets. There's no constituency for it anymore. Well, you see, John, you've got to make a constituency. Mm. I don't think there ever was really a constituency for balanced budgets, surplus budgets. You know, but a few of us decided to make one. And you know, I've 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 heard people in politics. Oh, I can't find a constituency for this anymore. What do you think? I found one. You found one. We went out there and we spoke to people. We, we talked to them about why this was a problem. We created a constituency. You know, if you let these things go by default, of course nobody will sort of put their hand up for it. We're talking about these upcoming expenses. Uh, interest rates are most rapidly growing, <laughs> the interest cost of the debt. You've got others, you've got an out of control NDIS, which might as well have been designed with to booby trap future taxpayers. Not saying the objectives weren't right, but talk about badly designed. Mm. You've got expenditures everywhere with demands for more. We've already got a horrendous gap opening up between receipts uh, and, and government expenditure. And a lot of people saying we've got to raise taxes, which will be counterproductive because we know that will restrict growth. Then in the midst of all of this, now we're saying, the left particularly is saying, we can't afford these submarines. I just sort of think, frankly, at a 300 million, what price freedom for a start? But we spent more than that in one year on COVID. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's three hundred billion over thirty years. Yeah, um, in out dollars. In so th th that's that's not a lot of money uh, in in defence spending. Actually, uh, you know, we, we always used to think we should spend uh, two percent, at least two percent of GDP on on defence. So it's, it's eminently doable. Uh, you know, when you, when you gather it up as a 30-year number, it sounds a lot, but 
I could gather you up a 30-year number on the NDIS, which would be a lot bigger than that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the critical thing there, I think, is to get value for money, though. Um, this is the one... I'm in favour of uh, the nuclear subs, but the one thing I learnt yes. in doing defence acquisition over a long period mm-hmm. of time is, you know, mm-hmm. they don't necessarily come on time, these things. They don't necessarily come up, come in on budget. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think there's got to be a lot of rigour and a lot of discipline around the delivery of that. Now, there's another challenge for further finances, and it does go to the heart of geopolitical issues, in my view. We, we are now committed to net zero by 2050. It seems to me that I can see personally no technological or political path to net zero by 2050 as I stand, as I sit. I'm not a climate change denier, but I just think this is where we're not thinking clearly enough. There's going to be a lot of tough choices made. If we make bad choices, we will we'll actually be effectively doing what we did in COVID. Government will be in the business, I think, of reducing economic activity. I think that's right. Uh, you... you that's not it's, 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 it's one thing to agree on the target. It's another thing to actually deliver the target. I, I was in that school that always used to say, let's figure out how we can do something before we announce we're going to do it. Right? <laughs> These days you just announce you're going to do it and you've got no idea. I mean, f- for example, in this country, we, we now know we're going to have to rebuild the whole transmission uh, yes. system, right? Because... Transmission towers essentially come from coal-fired power stations to big metropolises, right? Well, they're going to have to be rebuilt so they come from huge solar farms or wind farms or something to big metropolises. It's got to be rebuilt. You don't have to put these transmission towers over farmers' land, you know? You, you, you wait till all this goes off to oh, a land and environment the other environmental <laughs> courts. No one's thought about this. <laughs> you know, five years, yeah. ten years in the yeah. court system before we sort of start building... It's the cost of the whole thing. You know, this is this is an enormous transformation, right? Uh, and in the middle of all of this, you know, prices are, are going up, and 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 the public, rightly, inflation's going up, power prices going up, gas prices are going up. You know, my wages aren't going up, my taxes are going up. This is going to be, you know, it, it's all very well to sort of say, oh, you know. I, 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 I love a pie in the sky. I think there's a lot of more serious thing has got to go on as to how do you deliver that pie, frankly. The reason that I say it goes to global geopolitics is that if we're not careful in the West, I believe we will damage our economies. I mean, one pointer is Germany. Another is Colorado. I, I, I beg your pardon, California. See, California's got the wealthiest people that have ever walked the surface of the earth in absolute and relative terms at the top. Yeah. They've driven out with their energy policies the middle classes because it's gone with industry. Mm. It's gone to Miami. It's gone to Utah. It's gone to China. Mm. And the only 80% of the jobs emerging, I'm told, in California now are low paid. So you're actually setting up a new feudalism. Yeah, look, I think, I think this is the thing Australia's really got to get to grips with. You know, we are a, a, a gas superpower. And gas unquestionably, is the transition energy source. You know, there's going to have to be a lot of gas uh, available to power up electricity on short notice uh, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. And it's not just us in Australia, but countries around the world need our gas. I mean, the Germans need our gas. They're not, they're not going to be getting it from Russia, I don't think, uh, in a reliable way. Uh, so w- we would be mad, frankly, from our own point of view, but also from the world's point of view. Yeah, that's an important point. To, it's not to just stop us. the export of gas. Mm. Mad. And yet the Greens will tell us because it's... it's a no new be- gas, they say. No yeah, but hang on, they'll say, you've got it on the ABC, frankly. You've mm. got to listen to the science. Mm. We've got a climate change emergency. Mm. Oh, but the scientists are telling us we have a gas mm. is the, mm. the only way we'll get there. Mm. 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 But no, mm. we don't listen to that. Mm. So the Greens know more about our ch- than about Well, this again, than... it comes back to what we were saying before. A, a, emotion triumphs mm. logic yeah. in the modern world, right? So you can sit down there and you can talk about the importance of gas, not just for Australia, but for the rest of the world. Uh, and what's the answer? Oh, well, look, the, 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 we've got a catastrophe and the world will end. 
emotion triumphs logic. Mm. And it will continue to triumph logic, in my view, until such time as um, people are sitting in houses that they can't afford to heat. Mm. And they'll think to themselves, hmm, you know, this is not a very good situation. Uh, you've got to have some realism, you yeah, know, I think, to start, yep. to start yep. thinking of the consequences yep. of all of this. Well, I agree with that, and that was the point that uh, I was wanting to draw out. But now let's, let's come to the Greens for a moment and defence. Uh, I amused myself over the weekend by reading the Greens' defence policy. Mm. Now, they want to defund the Australian Defence Forces. <laughs> they're completely opposed uh, to uh, the Americans. I mean, they're the only country listed as a bad actor. Apart from ourselves, the Americans. Is that right? Mm. Yeah, no, it's not the Chinese, not the North Koreans. It's mm. not, it's not um, the Iran. It's not Russia. Um, I would have thought that if you were worried about climate change, you'd want the Western-based liberal rules-based order, if I can put it that mm. way, to survive. You'd think so. You would think so, wouldn't you? What do they say? I'm, I'm sort of amazed by this. What, what what do they say should be done in Ukraine? Well, they're, they're silent if, on it. If, oh, well, if, no, if, sorry. If, I beg your pardon. They I, do. They do have an answer. Uh, All conflict must be resolved uh, by peaceful means. Yes. We need to sit around the table yes. and Australia should put together an international team of, uh, or an internationally respected team of peace negotiators. Yes. Uh, with, uh, which is politically correct, yes. of course, in terms of its composition. And, 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 and Putin will just sit down and say, you were right, I shouldn't have invaded yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's fix it then. Yeah. That easy. But there are educated people all over the people in Australia. In Australia who, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I saw someone say, oh, you know, the worst thing about the Ukraine war is that it will lead to increased emissions, which of course it will with, with armaments and tanks and everything as well. Okay. I mean, I'm not in favour of increased emissions, but, you know, if, you, if you're being bombed down in a city in Ukraine, you might think you've got more immediate problems at the moment than the increased emissions that these torpedoes are bringing. As you know, I'm deeply invested in agricultural research and I'm, I'm to this day, uh, deeply uh, interested in how we feed people. We're doing a stunning job. We're mm. feeding five mm. billion people a day, every day more than we were 50 years ago. Mm. We've dramatically cut stunting of children and malnutrition, those sorts of things. It's an incredible success story. But, you know, it's dependent on cheap energy and ammonia. The four great emitters, everybody focuses on electricity, but mm. it's steel, concrete, electricity, and ammonia. Half the world's grain production depends upon ammonia. Mm. We don't have a substitute. Mm. Half the world's grain production. But you see, these are logical arguments. This is the problem. You know, I don't, I, if, you were, if you were in a debate with a green now and you put that, that's a logical argument. The answer would be, but the world's going to end. Which is not, by the right. way, what the ICPP no, says. Of course it's not. Of course it's not. And you know, I, I was present at one of these sort of debates and uh, the Green was having trouble explaining um, why we couldn't have nuclear power. And in the end, the Green just said, well, we've got to listen to the children and the children are against nuclear power. And I, you know, I thought to myself, it's a funny world, isn't it? What, for most of the world's history, the idea was you listen to your elders because yeah. they had experience, right? Mm. Now you listen to the children who don't have experience, right? Because I guess they're purer, they're, they're untainted by original sin, they, 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 they know the truth. They've not and been so corrupted by education. We, well, the, the readily being corrupted by education, but uh, <laughs> a different kind of education. Now, so to the hard-nosed <laughs> end of all of this, so the hard-nosed end of all of this is that as we know now, the autocrats look at the West and say they're in terminal decline, mm. they're degenerate, mm. here's the opportunity for adventurism. Mm. The good news is that the, um, the West has pulled together in the face of Ukraine, and it must have been a real check in Beijing. You know, we haven't lost our way completely, Peter. You know, the I think that's right. Much the, the, further reaching than they expected. The, American armaments have been to provide, well, not just American, but mainly American. They've been there. They're very high quality. But we're still, I think, in grave danger. I agree with that. we would not want to take the foot off the pedal. Things like AUKUS must be supported. They must be driven. We can't go back to emotively thinking about our safety and security in the world. Yeah, the dictators look at the West and say the West is weak, the West is soft. It's our opportunity to rewrite the global rules. I think that's a big part of it. Um, 
But, you know, dictators made that mistake about the West before. Yes. Hitler made that yes. mistake too. Yeah. Uh, that, that democracies are slow to rouse, but pushed far enough, what we learnt in the, in the 30s and the 40s, pushed far enough, they could be roused. Um, can they still be roused? Yeah. Uh, this is the question, isn't it? Um, I think they can be if, if it's a direct enough attack. So you take 9-11, a direct attack, that roused America. Um, would they still have the fighting spirit that, uh, that, that they eventually showed to the democracies, the, the Anglo democracies, in the, in the 30s and the 40s? My suspicion is we're softer, that we wouldn't have the staying power. But if the, if the threat is direct enough, I think we can still be roused, would be my assessment. I think the dictators, I think Putin thought that they couldn't be roused. That, you know, he, and, and bear in mind, he, he, he'd had more or less a free hand in Crimea. So he's a free hand in Crimea, we'll take a free hand here. Actually, you know, the people who really roused the conscience and are really doing the fighting of the Ukrainians themselves. So yes. I should take it back. I, I, we've supplied weapons, but, but it's the Ukrainians that have been roused and uh, be bearing fair, the brunt. To be fair, Beijing would also be looking at the sanctions, though, thinking, gee, if the Yanks managed to coordinate that, if we did something in Taiwan, if they managed to get the Europeans as well as themselves to impose economic sanctions, That'd be a bit of a problem. It'd do immense damage to the Chinese economy. It could, but you see, the thing about the Chinese um, economy is, if if it turns down, obviously the Chinese people wouldn't like it. But the Chinese government is not really susceptible to public opinion, despite the fact that they backed off with COVID in the end. Uh, well, Didn't play it out too well. Wasn't working. It wasn't working. I mean. <laughs> that the locked protests. everybody down, you know. I think the, I, I think mm. the, but they hadn't eliminated COVID. We know that yeah. people were still dying. Mm. You know, uh, you know they don't run for the Chinese leadership doesn't run for election every three years. They don't have uh, newspapers that sort of um, uh, criticise the government. They've they've got a large immunity from public opinion. I think. I'm not saying things got terribly bad. You could have. Um, a revolution, but I, I would say a large immunity from public opinion, which means they've got staying power for much longer than uh, Western countries have, in my view. Um, but but I, you know, the, the whole thing about uh, Taiwan is is strategic ambiguity. Um, you know, you don't want the Chinese to know what the response is going to be. Um, because you you want them to think it could go badly, therefore don't try it. This is this is the nature of a uh, a deterrent. Of course, the thing about a deterrent is you hope you never have to use it, uh, but you want your enemy to believe you will. Um, uh, uh, that's the theory of deterrence. Peter, thank you. Uh, I think we both agree that uh, this is a wonderful country. It's worth fighting for its soul. Uh, and uh, we particularly want an environment where our children and our grandchildren, you and I both have grandchildren, uh, can enjoy some of the opportunity and, and, and benefits of being Australians. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time today. And thank you for your contribution.